Hi, my name's Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis. And today we're going to continue our conversation of chemical reactions and stoichiometry. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the classification of chemical reactions. Um, the nice thing here is that we're going to be focusing in specifically just on acid base material for this particular video. Do read the material and the link here shown. Um, it'll help make the video make a bit more sense. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So before we really talk more about acids and bases, um, I want to pause and I want to kind of take a few, maybe 100 uh, feet, miles back and look at this overall topic um, of solutions. Now, typically we are going to describe things as either being polar or nonpolar, and we're gonna get into why things are polar or nonpolar more so later in the semester, but it's important to uh, start to bring up the topic on a basic level now so that the uh, solubility rules that we're gonna talk about make a little bit more sense. And that's gonna help us have a better understanding of how acid-base chemistry is gonna go as well. So, we haven't talked about molecular structure yet, um, but we have talked about electrons. We said electrons circle around an atom um, in the electron cloud, and because they're negatively charged particles, it's reasonable to assume that those negatively charged particles don't want to be next to one another. Uh, and that's because of columbic repulsion, columbic interactions. Um, in a molecule, the electrons are shared between all of the atoms in a molecule um, and sometimes those electrons are spread evenly over a molecule, and sometimes they're spread unevenly. And if we have a, a molecule where they're spread unevenly, so that means that one part of the molecule has a little bit more uh, density of electrons than another, so one part's a little bit uh, more negative-ish than the other side, which would be a little positive-ish. I say ish because they're not a formal positive and formal negative. It's just one side's got a little bit more electrons hanging around it, so it's got a little bit more uh, electron density there, so it's negative-ish. Um, in that regard, we say that the molecule is polar uh, and vice versa. It would be nonpolar if all of the molecules are distributed nice and evenly across the entire molecule. Now, this is a pretty big, broad way of thinking about polarity, um, but it's gonna be useful specifically when we think about water because water is a polar molecule and it's the solvent of choice for general chemistry. Um, because it's polar, it's going to have specific properties and interactions um, with other substances. And this is because the electrons in a water molecule tend to spend more time around the oxygen atom than they do the two hydrogens. So because water is molar molecule, spends more time, uh, we're going to draw it out like this over here. Um, so we're gonna say that the oxygen gets a partial negative charge. So that uh, funny little symbol there is the lowercase Greek delta. Um, so a like the triangle, uh, the uppercase Greek delta is indicative that we have a full blown charge. But here we're just saying it's kind of like a baby charge. Um, and so we give it the little delta. Because water has this partial negative side, this partial positive side, it's really great at dissolving ionic compounds. So what we've got in this image is a molecule or a formula unit, better way of saying it, of sodium chloride. So we've got the sodium ion that's positively charged interacting with the chloride ion that's negatively charged. Now we toss that in the water, and you've probably done this yourself, you notice that it dissolves. Well, what's actually happening on an atomic scale though? Wheel. What's happening is that that positive sodium ion is floating around and a lot of water molecules then circle around the sodium ion. And they circle around such that the oxygen is oriented towards the sodium ion um, because the oxygen has that slight partial negative and the sodium has that fully formal positive charge. So the two interact 
favorably. And it takes a lot of water molecules to circle around a sodium. I only drew two here, but that's just because I got a little lazy. It would be a ton of water molecules. Um, we could do the exact same kind of thing here when we're talking about our chloride. The chloride's negatively charged, so that means the positive, partial positive side of the water molecule is gonna orient itself and it's going to form a circle or sphere of hydration around the chloride. So we have this water shell that encapsulates um, the ions in a very particular way. Terminology we would say is that the water hydrates these ions, and this is that sphere of hydration that I was talking about. The ability of something to dissolve like in the medium, so the, the ability for the solvent to dissolve the solute is what we call the solubility. Okay, And so dissolving, we're saying that we are separating these ions apart from one another. So how does that how does that relate to uh, acids and bases? Well, we're getting there. One way that we did early, early characterization of solutions was to say um, basically or to test how much electrical current would actually go through a solution. Um, solutions that transferred electrical current quite well were called strong electrolytes. And uh, solutions that did rather poorly were called weak electrolytes. And solutions that did nothing were called non-electrolytes. Um, oops, let's go back. You may have heard of this term electrolyte before if you've ever had any kind of sports drink like Gatorade, Powerade, etc. What they're saying is that they are replenishing your body with the ions necessary for your body to function. Um, so like when you sweat, you are sweating out a certain concentration of various salty things. And you know it's salty because sweat is salt tasting. So you need to replenish your body with that kind of salt because the ions allow for your, in solution, allow for your body to function properly. Like you need various ions for your muscles to contract, etc. cetera. Um, and this is really easily tested, this connectivity. Uh, if you've ever been to a science museum, you can like basically took, take an electrical wire here, an electrical wire here, and then you can put a light bulb uh, when it's set up properly, kind of over here, allow current to pass through those two wires that you put in. And if the light bulb turns on, congratulations, you've got yourself an electrolyte. And the brighter that that light bulb turns on indicates it is a stronger electrolyte because more current is passing through the solution. So strictly speaking, uh, if you had pure water, water would be a non-electrolyte. Now I know that everybody always thinks like, oh, you see lightning, you need to jump out of the pool because you do, you absolutely do. Um, the thing is, it's all the stuff that's dissolved in the water that allows the water to transfer an electrical current. The water by itself is actually really not good at transferring an electrical current. So there's your little fun uh, fact for the day. This kind of stuff uh, was really explored by Arrhenius, and like here's the link. There we go, link for uh, him and his Nobel Prize information because he did this thing where he made this um, uh, theory that um, conductivity of solutions was based off of the presence of ions. And so he really, before ions were really studied and were a thing, he figured out that they existed and he figured out that the conductivity was so uh, so much based off of this. It was really groundbreaking work. Um, yeah, Adams and like the whole Rutherford experiment and all that jazz had not happened when he made these uh, statements and uh, came up with these theories. So it was really very important for chemistry. Um, specifically, Going back to what we just said with strong and weak electrolytes in mind, um, the amount of current, the amount of conductivity is based off of your number of ions. The more ions you have in solution, the more conductive that solution is going to be. Strong electrolytes Thus, we're going to define as substances that completely ionize when they are dissolved in water. So that means when we put a salt 
we put an acid in water, if it completely ionizes, that means the cation completely separates from the anion 100% of the time, we got ourselves a strong electrolyte. Um, strong electrolytes include strong acids. They also include strong bases because you can't really have an acid if you don't have a base. So that's one of the key uh, hallmarks of an acid-base reaction, right? You got to have both. You can't just have the acid. You can't have just the base. Something's going to act as an acid. Something's going to act as a base. And it's kind of incumbent upon you to figure out which one is doing which. And we'll help you with that. Um, the other things that are going to act as strong electrolytes are the salts of strong acids and bases. Um, and what we mean by a salt of a strong acid or base is, like in the case of a strong acid, we're going to take the anion portion of said acid and we're going to put some cation in the front of it. For example, hydrochloric acid, right? Um, we're, I'm going to tell you right now, that's one of our strong acids. The chloride is the anion of hydrochloric acid. If we put a metal cation in front of that chloride, such as sodium, now the sodium, right, having sodium chloride is a salt. It is a salt that comes from strong acid, hydrochloric acid, and strong base, sodium hydroxide. So that's what we're talking about when we say salts of strong acids and bases. Now, I've said this before, I'll say it a million times in the future. We have lots of definitions for acids and bases. The one that we're gonna focus on right this moment though is that of an Arrhenius acid. Um, an Arrhenius acid is gonna be defined as a substance. A substance is an acid if it produces protons when dissolved in water, okay? So this is like our most uh, strict definition because we have to be producing protons we have to be having water as our solvent and believe it or not that's actually fairly uh that, that can kind of confines what actually can act as an acid fairly restrictively um in that which is chemistry so our general formula for that is going to be listed like you see here so h a that's gonna be what we normally write out as our generic acid. So the H is our proton. The A is the anion generic. Just whatever our anion is. Anion, right, eh, see what we did there? Anion, yeah. Acid, uh, uh, uh. If it is soluble, and most of our acids are, we're gonna put that AQ there to indicate that it's aqueous. If we put it in water, namely H2O liquid, it will form H3O+, plus, which is our hydronium ion, and it will have the free anion floating around. So whatever that anion, anion was of our acid, our strong acid, it will now exist as an anion floating around that is being hydrated by the rest of the water molecules that were not involved in the reaction. So we're bringing all those terms here into play. This is so important. When you have a strong acid, every single acid molecule will completely ionize. Ionize means it separates into its individual ions. If you have 100 molecules of nitric acid, you're gonna have 100 molecules, well, ions, of protons and you're gonna have a hundred ions of nitrate. Always gonna completely disassociate. That's the definition of a strong acid. Completely disassociates, 100% ionizes, mean the exact same. Now, for your strong acids, it's really just best if you memorize this list. Here's your list, just, just memorize it. Um, now, I do want to note that for sulfuric acid, it's H2SO4. Only the first hydrogen will ionize completely. So even though it says H2, we're really only going to act like it's monoprotic, meaning one proton comes off. Mono, one, protic, proton. It's 
only one comes off. We would be left with HSO4 minus. HSO4 minus is not a strong acid. Okay, that's the only kind of tricky one, if you will, that's here on the list. It is really worth your time to memorize these and every time you see these go, oh, that's a strong acid. It's worth it. Your strong bases, um, we're gonna stick to the definition of an Arrhenius base. It's gonna be a base if you uh, produce hydroxide ions in water. Okay, so specifically, we're gonna have to produce hydroxide ions in water. Just like with the Arrhenius acid, this is actually a very narrow definition of a base. Um, classic example is sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide pure is a white uh, substance. It's usually shipped as a pellet. When you put it in water though, it completely disassociates and forms sodium ions and hydroxide ions. Okay, it completely disassociates. You have zero sodium hydroxide remaining. It's just sodium ions that are being hydrated and hydroxide ions that are being hydrated. So again, that definition is every molecule ionize into the cation and hydroxide. So bases by the Arrhenius definition are gonna have the generic thing of some cation and a hydroxide ion. Um, just like with the other, for every 100 molecules of calcium hydroxide we have present, we're going to form 200 ions of hydroxide. Why is it 200? Why is it not 100? Well, because the calcium hydroxide has the chemical formula of CaOH2. So it takes two hydroxide ions for every one calcium hydroxide molecule or formula unit. Thus, if it all completely disassociates, two hydroxides will be ionized and be liberated upon the uh, dissolving of calcium hydroxide in water. So you have 200 ions of hydroxide, you'll have 100 ions of calcium, okay? Because of balanced equations. Again, it's really worth your time here to just, whoops, memorize. It's worth your time to memorize this list of strong bases. Um, now, depending on who you talk to, some of these bases on here aren't going to be considered strong. Um, the reason is because their solubility uh, is fairly low, but go ahead and consider this list your strong bases for right now. It's a good thing and we'll pare down what that uh, more of that technical stuff as we go on further in the semester when we learn some more topics. So for right now, go ahead and do that. I'm telling you right now, this is not the whole picture, but for where we're at with our uh, common understanding amongst the class, this is a good place to start. We will pare this down though um, and be more clear about why, where the exceptions are as we go along in the course. Now the salts, like I said, this is a situation where you're gonna take a strong acid and you're gonna mix it with a strong base. And when you do that, you're gonna get a salt and a water. So what we, ha what we have here above me is a very classic example of any kind of acid-base reaction. There in the light blue is sodium hydroxide. That's our base. Our base with our red, which is our acid, is going to form water and a salt. So at base plus acid always ha will have the products of water in liquid water specifically and salt. Now that salt sometimes is soluble and sometimes isn't. It comes down to your solubility rules. For the salt of a strong acid and a strong base, it will always be soluble. It will always be soluble. Whatever strong acid you mix with whatever strong base you mix, the salt that gets generated as a product will be a completely soluble species, okay? It just always works that way. We can do the exact same thing with a different combination. So here we have potassium hydroxide, a strong base, uh, hydrobromic acid, a strong acid, and this mixes with, or these mix, and we form water, and we form potassium bromide. Potassium bromide is the salt of a strong acid and a strong base. 
Now, weak electrolytes, um, we're going to touch on briefly here, and we're going to touch more of the touch more on these in general chemistry too. Um, and depending if we have time, we'll touch more of them on them uh, when we get into later chapters here in Gen Chem one. But you're definitely going to see a lot of these in Gen Chem two. Key difference between them is they only ionize to a small degree. So a strong electrolyte completely ionizes a weak electrolyte, meh, just a teeny little bit. Um, so they form a relatively small number of ions when they dissolve. Um, so typically your weak electrolytes are weak acids and weak bases. And there's way more weak acids and weak bases than there are strong acids and strong bases. Um, and that's why they're so important, but that's also makes them because they only disassociate to a small degree and it's a different amount for every single small acid, or I'm sorry, for every single weak acid and a different amount for every weak base that makes the math a little bit more tricky. So we want to get good at some of the concepts right now, namely stoichiometry. Um, and we will go back and we'll cover more about weak electrolytes and weak, uh, weak electrolytes in general later on. Classic weak electrolyte uh, that we will use uh, to try to explain this is acetic acid. It's how do you know it's a weak acid? Because it ain't on your list of strong acids. That's why I'm saying memorize those because then you can look at something and if it says, oh, this is an acid, you can say, well, that ain't one of my strong acids. That tells you immediately this is one of your weak acids. It's such an important list to memorize. So you have your weak acid and it interacts with uh, water. And so it disassociates and it forms hydronium and it forms acetate. But you see how it's got the forward arrow and the backward arrow? That's because it doesn't disassociate completely. It does not 100% ionize and stay ionized. Uh, it only ionizes to a very small amount. Um, so that's the thing. Uh, a weak base such as uh, ammonia here also does the same thing. It can interact with water because water, believe it or not, acts as either an acid or a base, that amphoteric behavior that it has, amphoteric behavior. It can act as an acid or a base. In this case, the ammonia is a stronger base than the water molecule is, so the ammonia can take a proton off of the water and we're left behind with hydroxide. Strictly speaking, based off of our Arrhenius definitions, acetic acid is an acid because it formed hydronium, the equivalency of protons, in water. Ammonia formed hydroxide in water. So these both count under our Arrhenius definitions. Okay, and we're gonna finish up here with non-electrolytes. So non-electrolytes dissolve in water, but they don't produce ions. Um, and so because they don't produce ions, um, they, in theory, should not carry an electrical current through them. Um, sugar does not uh, produce ions to a large amount when dissolved in water. Um, if you take a look at the structure here, um, it's, this is just like your generic sugar molecule, uh, saccharose. Um, it does not split up into an appreciable amount. It just stays like this. It will still be hydrated by water molecules um, so that it dissolves. And you know that if you've ever been to McAllister's and you've had their sweet tea, you know you can put a lot of sugar into water if you've ever had their sweet tea. Um, I don't actually recommend their sweet tea. It's like, it'll just like your teeth rot out as you drink it. Um, but strictly speaking, the sugar, it really doesn't do much in water. Now, for those of you who are, uh, really chemically minded, you might be seeing these OH groups right here. Um, and you might say, uh, I'm sorry, professor, but actually, uh, every time you have an alcohol such as this, um, there is a potential for this hydrogen to come off and for this molecule to ionize to which I would say, yes, yes, you form ions, you form ions at such a ridiculously low concentration that we're going to go ahead and call this a non-electrolyte. We're going to call the amount of ions that you are forming pretty much a non-event. Um, yeah, everything dissolves to like the smallest amount, 
But like, like if you throw a rock into a swimming pool, some of that rock is going to dissolve. That doesn't mean it's an appreciable amount. Um, but yeah, technically it dissolves, but it's kind of like a lands in the so what category. Sugar kind of lands mostly in that so what category. It, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to call it a non-electrolyte. So when you're balancing acid-base reactions, turns out it's just like balancing any other reaction, but you need to keep track of the stuff that we talked about here previously, such as what are your definitions and what do you always produce in any acid-base reaction? Do you remember? Yes, you're right. You always produce a salt and water. And if you didn't say salt and water, you'll say salt and water the next time you're asked. Okay, and that is gonna be it for this video. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions and thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. If I can find the stop button.